Hello, good evening, and a very warm welcome to all. Happy Buddha Purnima to everyone. On the occasion of Buddha Purnima, I, Sonal Dikle, welcome you all to the 163rd episode of Virasat Talk series. This lecture series is conducted by the Buddhist Heritage Research Institute in collaboration with the Heritage Society Kashmir Circle. Our delegates of today are our distinguished speaker, Ms. Upasana Chetri, research, research investigator, Heritage Society Sikkim Circle. The welcome address will be presented by Mr. Azad Hind Gulshananda, director, BHRI Heritage Society. The chanting will be done by Mr. Dhamma Ratna, research assistant, Heritage Society, Nalanda chapter. The vote of thanks will be presented by Mr. Abdul Adil Parai, program convener, Heritage Society, Kashmir Circle. And our chairperson, Dr. Anand Ashitosh Divedi, Director General, Heritage Society. I call upon Mr. Azad Hind Gulshan Nanda to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Namo Buddhaya Dharmaya Cha Sanghaya Cha Namo Namo. Respected Bhadant Dhamma Ji, Honorable Chairman, Dr. Anand Ashtos Duvedi Sahab. Our distinguished speaker, Upasana Ji, moderator, Sonal Dekhle Ji, program convener, Abdul Adil Pade Ji, our organizing committee, and our beloved followers and distinguished visitors of Heritage Society. Namaskar, and a very happy Buddha Purnima to all of you. I extend my warm greetings on this special day of Buddha Jayanti to all of you. The Buddha Jayanti is being celebrated all over the Buddhist world today and on this day the full moon of Vaishakh month it is also called Vaishakh Purnima the other name of Buddha Purnima is Buddha Jayanti or Vaishakh Purnima so why this day is so special why do we celebrate Buddha Purnima a simple reason to this is that this day is celebrated at as the birth anniversary of the historical Lord Buddha this day is auspicious Auspicious is this day because Siddhartha Gautama, the prince of Kapilavastu, took birth in Lumbini. Auspicious is this day also as Siddhartha Gautama attained enlightenment and achieved Buddhahood under the Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya. Prince Siddhartha became Buddha, the enlightened one. Auspicious is also this day as Lord Buddha attained Mahapari Nirvana in Kushinagar after preaching the eightfold path and sending the universal message of compassion, peace, and harmony to the world for continuous 45 years after the enlightenment. So this day holds an immense importance, not only in the Buddhist world, but also in the world history, as three major events happened today. The birth of Lord Buddha, the enlightenment of Lord Buddha, and the Mahapari Nirvana of Lord Buddha. So Lord Buddha's eternal message of compassion, peace, and brotherhood has caught the imaginations of millions of humans across the world from since time immemorial. It has enlightened the soul of uncountable human minds in the past and has inspired the history to give birth to in innumerable institutions such as the first pan Indian empire of the Dhamma Raja Shoka, who is still uh, very famous and worshipped all across South Asia and Southeast Asia, and the great Nalanda University in Bihar from where uh, our representative uh, Bhadant Dhamma Ratnaji is also a successor of this great tradition. Lord Buddha's message continues to inspire humanity and it has turned even more relevant in today's world. The expanse of disappointment, agony and frenzy of this pandemic which we are all are fighting all together has brought, has brought so many sufferings to many of us. What we need the most is to simply hold on to the compassion, support, care and kindness, the message that Lord Buddha preached thousands of years ago and which we need to share with one another. So on this very special day of Buddha Purnima, when we all have assembled together on this platform of Heritage Society, I bid my congratulations and welcome all of our uh, distinguished speaker, followers, our chairperson, sir, our all, our program conveners, organizing committee, all of you to this uh, very important occasion. Uh, thank you for joining us today. This program today is a public lecture and is live on various platforms on Facebook, 
Facebook page, on a YouTube channel of Heritage Society. So I request all of you who have joined us, all of our viewers and followers, to please join us today and let's celebrate together. Let's celebrate together and cherish the universal message of peace and harmony that that Buddha once preached thousands of years ago. The the light that came up from the Nalanda, from the Bodhgaya, made this whole world be filled with those. I extend my congratulations to all of the staffs and officers of Heritage Society of uh, Buddhist Heritage Research Institute for uh, organizing this very beautiful program on this very special occasion and bringing out our, our distinguished speakers and a panel of speakers from different backgrounds, from different places, and a, lot, and, and a number of younger scholars to this platform. I welcome our distinguished speaker, Upasana Ji, currently research investigator in Heritage Society. She has also studied past in the Vishwa Bharti Santi Niketan and currently engaged at IIT Guwahati. Guwahati. She is carrying out research on Thanka paintings, a very important and a very relevant topic. She will be making a case study of Thanka paintings. So I congratulate Upasana Ji on, for bringing out such uh, important discussions today. Uh, I, I hope everyone will enjoy this. I also welcome Bhadanta Dhamma Ji for joining us directly from Nalanda, the great Nalanda Mahavihara. My salute and my prayer to the great monastery of Nalanda Mahavihara that existed for thousands of years and has uh, made a profound impact on not only on the Indian history, but the whole history of Asia. I also extend my welcome to our program convener, uh, Abdul Adil Parezi, our moderator whose task is very important, Sonia uh, Sonal Deklezi, and I also congratulate and I welcome and uh, our, our beloved Dr. Anand Pastos Devedi Ji uh, Sahab, who, who is working relentlessly, tirelessly all the time to bring out distinguished speakers from all over the world, from different parts of India and across the world, bringing out the, uh, the speakers on this important platform and, this, and what we celebrate each and every week. Uh, on different occasions, uh, the, the public lectures, and this is what this pandemic has, uh, how it has connected the whole academic world. So I once again uh, welcome you all to this important occasion, and I uh, and once again a very happy Buddha Purnima, Vaishakha Purnima, Buddha Jayanti to all of you. Uh, I now request uh, Sonal Dikleji to. Uh, uh, begin the program from here. Uh, thank you so much. Dhanyavad. Let us begin the lecture with a chant. I call upon Mr. Dhamma Ratna to proceed with it. Mm -hmm. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Uh, OK. First of all, uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Dhammaratna, and I am a research scholar student at Navnalanda Mahavihara, Minister of Culture, Government of India. First, uh, I would like to thanks to the organizing committee, especially thanks to, to Dr. Anand Ashutosh, Dwaiti Sir, Director General, Heritage Society, and Mr. Azad, Director of BHRI, Heritage Society, and all the staff member and the organizing committee. So today is Bud Purnima also. I wish you all happy Bud Purnima to all. And uh, you know the all pandemic situation, present condition of this world is facing. So I'm going to chant the Ratna Sutta. It's a very important Sutta in the Buddhism and it was uh, preaching by the Buddha in the ancient time in Vaishali. So first uh, I'm going to chant uh, the Ratna Sutta and then I will explain it, uh, why it's, uh, we are chanting and what is the importance of the Sutta. So first of uh, all, I would like to start with the uh, Namo Tessa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tessa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Namo Tessa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Anita Nado Pataya, Tata Gadeda, Deda Parmio, Deda Upa Parmio, Deda Parmeta Parmio di 
Tamadiya Parmiyo Pensa Mahaparisake Loka Dasriya Nyate Dasriya Bodhe Dasriya Ti Tito Sriya Yo Pensi Mabuhi Nakwanti Zati Abhi Dika Mane Pada Nasriya Bodhi Panlake Mara Wizya Tabanyuta Jana Pati Uyda Tamasa Ka Bwata Dan Nawala Kodra Damehi Tabi Pipi Bodha Gune Awezi Dwa Vitaliya Titu Pakarande Tu Tiya Marandu Paridhan Karando Tayatama Nandra Dira Tiya Guru Jati Zi Upa Pedwa Tita Tadaka Saka Wale Tu Dewa Da Yadana Pati Dengde Ti Pesa Vitaliya Pure Roga Mnuta Udaya Tamute Uti Dampa Yen Khi Kem Narada Pimmi Pariten Dampa Nama He Yanni Na Buddha Ni Dama Gata Ni Bhuma Ni Vaya Ni Vaya Ndali Ke Tepi Va Buddha Tumme Na Buen Tu Ate Pi Vtisha Tunan Du Bhati Ten Teta Yi Buddha Ni Ta Me Ta Tepi Me Ten Karen Do Manu Te Yi Pasaya Ita Sa Saran Do Sa Ati Yi Pali Teta Yi Te Rata Ap Mata Yenke si iten wa uren wa ta ke tu wa yen re na pa ni ten na no ta ma ti te ta ka te na iten me po ten re na pa ni ten iten na te se na tu pi ti ho tu iya wiri ka me te pa ni ten pe se ka te cha mu ni ta ma i to na te na ta me na ta ma ti ke si iten me ta me re na pa ni ten iten na te se na tu pi ti ho tu Yen Buddha te to pari wa ni yen tu se tamma di vanta rita mahu tamma di na te na tamma na wese ti ita me da me ratna panita ita na te se na tu piti ho tu Yen Pukla pa ta te ta pe ta se ta ri ka ni yu ka ni ho ti ti e ta ti ya tu ka te ta wa ta ita ta ti ka ni wa ke la ni ita me tangke ratna panita ita na te se na tu piti ho tu Ye tu pa te ta ma ne ta te te na ne ka mi no ko ta ma na ta mi Te pa te vi ta ma te vi ya le ta u ma ni pu te pe su ma na I te me ta nghe ra na pa ni te i te na te se na tu pi ti o tu Ye ti ka ni la pa ta vi ti to ti ya sa tu pi u ya te ta ma mi yo Ta tu pa ma ta pu pa ra wa ta mi yo ri ya te sa ni a we sa pa te ti I te me ta nghe ra na pa ni te i te na te se na tu pi ti o tu Yeriya tisa ni upe yanti gata ure nye na tute ka tita ni Kisa pite yeta bume ma teta na te buwe ata pe wa ti yanti Ita me tangke ra te na pa nita ite na te se na tupti o tu Ta we ta 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 ma ta ya te ta tu te ma sa ti ya bu yanti Ta ka yanti te wisi kisi te sa ti la ban ta wa ti te bi kisi sa do bu ma iti sa wi bu ma to se ta ti ta na ku ta kwa tu Ita me tangke ra na pa nita ite na te se na tupti o tu Kesa pito ime karo ti papa ke ka yi na wa sa uta so te ta wa Epa to wa te ta ve te ta ya Epa ta ti ta ve te ta uta Ita me tangke ra na pa ni ta i te na te se na tu te o tu Na ure ma ya ta ve ta ure ki ti na pa ma te pe ta me te ko ma u Ta tu pa ma ta ma u re a te te yi Ita me ni ka na pa ri mo a ta te ka ya Ita me te po ta ra na pa ni ta i te na te se na tu te o tu Rāvura nyu rāvura hō nautara dhamma vara tēnti Kita me bodhara na panita ite na te se na tūpti o tū Kita pūra ne na vana ti dhamma vana uri ta se ti o dhamma vana Te kita ta sa te aru sanda nipa ti ti ra ita vati vo Ita me tangkera na panita ite na te se na tūpti o tū Yanti na pūta ni dhamma kata ni pūva ni vo yanti vā yanta li ke Tata kata ni vā mūna uta pūse ta pūta na vā dhamma na ยานีนาบุตรานีธรรมกัตานีบุบานีวายานีวายดานีเกตตระกัตเตนเดวามโนตาบุเสตเตนเดมะนามะธรรมนาบุเหตุยานีนาบุตรานีธรรมกัตาน
thank you to all so uh, i just uh, finished the chanting of the ratna sutta it is very important sutta in the um, buddhist tradition and buddha was especially uh, precious in the Vesali when in the kind of like plague a kind of pandemic happened in the Vesali city so i would like to introduce some uh, uh, religious history of the this sutta why we are going to chant so the occasion of, of for this discourse the city of Vesali was affected by a famine causing death especially to the poor folk due to the presence of decaying crops the evil spirit began to hunt the city that was followed by a pestilence plague like plague by this their fear a famine non-human being and pestilence the citizens sought the help of the buddha who was living in the rajkiya they requested uh, to the buddha to come to the vesali to help uh, in this kind of pandemic situation so followed by a large number of monks including the venerable ananda he attended uh, the his attendant disciples the buddha came to the city of vesali with the arrival of the buddha there were torrential rains which swept away the purifying process the atmosphere become purified the city was become very clean so thereupon the buddha delivered the ratna sutta and in english we can call like the uh, the jewel discourse to the venerable ananda and give him instruction as to how he should tour the city with the lichwi citizen reciting the discourse as a mark protection to the people of Vishali. The Venerable Ananda follow the instruction and sparkled the sanctified water from the Buddha own arm all ball. As the consequence, the evil spirit were exorcised, the prestige less sub, um, subsided. Thereafter, the Venerable Ananda returned with the citizen of Vishali to the public hall where the Buddha and his disciple had assembled awaiting his arrival there the buddha recite the same jewel discourse to the gathering during the buddha time many people were benefit and uh, misfortunes were at but following the reciting of the ratna sutta this sutta also explained the highest quality of the buddha dharma and sangha by giving detail of the triple gems in its various facts and the uh, end of every Stanza, the Buddha bless everyone saying by the truth, may all being be happy and blessful. So uh, uh, after hearing this Ratna Sutta, even Saka in the ancient time, Saka, the king of goddess, become delighted and pay homage to the triple gems and at the last three verse. All I would like to request uh, all devotees who are listening and from the around the world so strongly if they know how to recite the ratna sutta they can recite every day in their daily life and uh, at the end i would like to say ite na teisa wasena dukha vipu samantu me it means may i be free from all danger ite na teisa wasena by you, Wupa may uh, Samandu may Miss May I be free from all fears. And Ite na Saja was a na Roga Wipu Samandu may so may I be free from all illness. So this is the all about the Ratna Sutta. The Buddha gave his disciple Ananda and asked to preach when this kind of pandemic situation happened in the Vesali city. Because at that time, many thousands of people already dead, so they invite to the Buddha. And at that time, Buddha was uh, staying in the Rajgi in the Greek food. And I think that was the fifth raining season started when the Buddha visit to the Vesali. So after Buddha visit and uh, reciting the Sutta, the all kind of uh, like um, bad thing is gone from the Vesali city. So this is the importance of the Ratna Sutta in the Buddhism. So most of the Buddhist people in like a Myanmar country, Thailand, Sri Lanka, all they are chanting every day in daily life. So this is the importance of the Ratna Sutta.
so thank you so much thank mr dhamma to all yes sir thank you so much uh, mr dhamma mm -hmm. ratna for explaining this sutra to us um, now i call our distinguished speaker ms upasna chetri to begin Uh, thank you so much, Sonal. I hope I'm audible. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. A uh, very good evening to everyone. Uh, I hope you all are healed and hearty. And um, on this uh, auspicious occasion of Buddha Purnima, I'm especially elated to talk about a topic uh, which is of much importance to the artistic tradition of Tibet. And subsequently, also to the uh, in the field of Buddhist art, and for that, I'm thankful to Heritage Society, uh, Dr. Anant Ashutosh Duvedi, Mr. Azad, and uh, the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. So, without further ado, allow me to start with today's uh, talk, which is titled "Of Canvas and Colors: A Case Study of Thangka Painting in Darjeeling." So Tibetan paintings are a, a vibrant blend of colors, of figures, and a complex world of symbolism which is attached to them. Apart from also being a visually aesthetic, visually beautiful to look at, they contain immense um, ritual, spiritual, um, and symbolic value. So there are three kinds of uh, Tibetan paintings. The first one is the mural on the walls of the monasteries, the thangkas. And uh, the first picture will show you that the, uh, the murals which are painted on the walls and the thangkas which are hung from the ceiling. And the third one, third kind, is the manuscript il illustrations. Uh, today we are basically going to talk about the thangkas, uh, which is of substantial significance to the Tibetan artistic tradition, as I mentioned. And also I'll be discussing, I'll basically only be discussing the step-by-step -step process by which a thangka is uh, created. So let us have a look at uh, why a thangka is so important. Uh, in the past, the thangkas were carried by monks to far off lands, uh, to remote areas, to preach the Buddhist doctrines to those places where they, where monasteries and Buddhist temples were not available, or you know, uh, where there were where there was dearth of Buddhist temples, so huge thangkas like this, like the one shown in the picture, were unrolled and they were displayed on the monastery walls, or they were displayed on the ramparts uh, during annual ceremonies or during village fairs or special rituals, rituals. And once the purpose was served, they were rolled back again. So owing to uh, the nature of usage, owing to the nature of usage uh, yeah. of the thangka and also the material, the fabric that the thangka was made of, it was easy for monks to carry them. It was, it was easy for them to roll up and carry them to, from places to places. And um, one reason why this was done was during uh, annual fairs or during uh, you know, annual ceremonies, one reason was that, um, you know, they always wanted to be in the presence of the divine. And also the highest position, the, 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 the um, you know, the highest position was assigned to the divine. And so that's why uh, there is a tradition of doing this. And this has continued till today. Even today in the monasteries, we find huge thangkas which are hung on the walls. So, this, so there is also a spiritual significance to this where uh, there is a concept called tongrul, which is used, uh, where the thangka is used as an aid for meditation. Merely because uh, viewing a thangka is said to transport the beholder from this material world to the, to the divine world, you know, to the divine realm. Now it, it is said that, so it is used as an object of meditation. It is meditated upon, it is pray, prayed upon, pray, prayed upon. And another usage for thangka was also uh, by the merchants and traders. Now they had to go from one place to another place 
so they used to carry their um, uh, carry a small small thangas of the tutelary deities of the yidams that uh, they are called so that um, you know they feel safe they feel protected or along the way if they want to um, meditate upon or pray upon they would unroll their thangka pray and then uh, keep it back so this is also one of the reasons uh, merchants and traders are also one of the reasons why styles or you know the methods of making the process of making a thangka disseminated to vast stretches of land from this part of the country to another now let us look at the origin of the word thangka which is which comprises two words than and yik and it means written record or something that unrolls now another name for thangka is rishri it's pronounced as rishri which means design on cotton but the name thangka is more preferred to the name rishri simply because there are also thangkas which are made of silk linen hemp and leather so uh, the word design on cotton does not you know apply to silk linen or hemp so the general word thangka is preferred in nepal the thangkas are known as paubhas and um, uh, the the thangka painters the artists are known as pun whereas in the tibetan tradition they are known as known as laripas now the word lari means to write gods it directly translates to to write gods so lari and pa means a person so lari pa means somebody who writes gods or somebody who paints there is another word also rimopa which means Uh, to put lines into place there are many kinds of thangka we are only talk we are only when we say thangka we only think that uh, you know there are paintings done on canvas but there are so many other kinds of thangkas as well let us have a look at some of them uh, so the first kind is called the shontang thangka it is created by painting on canvas under shontang thangka there are various uh, there are variations of shontang thangkas and the first one is called the chutsun thangka uh, this type of thangka uses colors uh, which is derived from vegetable and mineral uh, excuse excuse me i think there is something wrong with the the audio i'm being able to hear my own voice um Yes, there is a slight echo, Upasna. Uh, uh, yes, hello. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm being able to hear my own voice actually, so that's uh, creating a distraction. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Upasna ji. Uh, yes, sir. uh so in in the bottom of the screen you have an option of settings cam mic it is written cam mic setting option you can click on that and then after clicking there is an option audio yes in the, uh -huh, in the audio there is a echo cancellation okay it is already clicked yes you can uh -huh, you can once again uh, you can click it on two times and then possibly it will work um hello Huh. Yeah, you are clearly audible. Okay. Uh, so as I was talking about the Chutson Thangkas. these are thangkas these are painted uh, on canvas but then it uh, the paints the colors are derived from vegetable sorry vegetable organic and mineral pigments so then so under the shontang thangkas the other one is called the nakthang thangkas now nakthang the word nak means black in tibetan so the background is black as you can see and the paintings are done either in golden or red color so this is a beautiful depiction of a nakthang thangka uh the next one is called a marthang or a shalthang thangka mar means red and shal means uh, vermilion so so this kind of thangka has a red background with golden or um pay, uh, the, with with golden or uh, black lines on it a 
apart from that, the fourth kind is called the shirt thang thangka, where the background is golden in color and the line drawings are red. Uh, I do not have a picture of this, I'm sorry, but you can imagine how pretty it would look, you know, with the golden background and lines drawn in red. Uh, that was painting on canvas. Now let us look at other kinds of thangka which are prepared differently. So uh, the first one in this in, in this category is the sh is called shingpar thangka, where wooden blocks are used to print the outline. So these the outlines are not painted in this. The wooden blocks are used to print it, and uh, the method by which this printing is done, the process of printing, is called pouncing. Uh, this shingpar thangka became popular in Tibet after thirteenth fourteenth century uh, due to the Chinese. Chinese influence uh, and uh, and it and it also became popular because there was a growth in the demand of thangkas. So uh, in order to meet the demand, meet the growing demand, you know, instead of painting it, meticulously painting it, printing was much more feasible that way. The next one is called the lendrup thangka, where it is made uh, with the help of cloth applique. So as we know, applique method is, you know, uh, small pieces of cloth and we join it, we, draw, we stick it or either hew it. And then, um, you know, a thangka is created. The next is called the tatrup thangka, where the thangka, the entire thangka is woven. So there are no different components attached to this. Like, for example, the canvas or the paints or, you know, the, clo uh, the cloth pieces. From the very outset, the thangkas are woven. Even the designs are made by weaving it. The next one, this is a very beautiful depiction of a Shendrup Thangka, which is made by embroidery, embroidering on cloth. Now, having uh, discussed the different kinds of Thangka, let us try to understand how the tradition must have started and uh, where it must have originated. So the, the Thangkas that we see today either in the monasteries or um, or in the museums, do not date back to earlier than 12th, 11th, 12th century CE. But there are textual sources which tell us, which indicate that um, the concept of Thangka was present even before 11th, 12th century. So the first one is Faihan. I guess there is some technical issue. I... Mr. Azad, can you look into it? Uh, Upasana ji, you are not audible. I think there is a network issue at her side. Possibly some uh, the electricity went away, maybe because of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Possibly she is trying to reconnect with us. She will be with us in a couple of seconds, I hope. पासना जी ज्वाइन कर रही हैं हम लोगों को वहाँ उधर स्टॉम आ गया है बहुत बहुत बड़ा तूफान आ गया इसलिए इंटरनेट कनेक्शन का और इलेक्ट्रिसिटी का प्रॉब्लम उनको हो गया है तो दूसरे नेटवर्क यूज़ करके वो ज्वाइन करेंगी बहुत ही सुंदर टॉपिक है इनका हम लोगों को दरअसल मालूम नहीं था कि थंका का इतना वेराइटी होता है व्यक्तिगत तौर से मुझे नहीं मालूम था इतने वेरिएशन के थंकाज होते हैं मुझे लगा कि थंका सिर्फ एक ही टाइप का होता है मुरल पेंटिंग वाल पे होता है और मैनस्क्रिप्ट यूज़ करते हैं आदिल आदिल उधर कश्मीर से ज्वाइन किए हुए हमारे साथ 
तब तक हम लोग अपना एक्सपीरियंस शेयर करें थंकाज को लेके आदिल उधर की क्या स्थिति है थंकाज उधर उधर तो पेंटिंग मुरल पेंटिंग मुनास्टी में ज्यादा मिलता होगा कश्मीर रीजन में यस सर थंकाज वगैरह अगर हम सर बात करेंगे यहाँ पे जो लद्दाख रीजन है लद्दाख रीजन में जो बुद्धिस्ट मोनास्ट्रीज हैं तो उनमें हम देखते हैं जो थंका पेंटिंग्स हैं वो यूजुअली एक कॉटन या फिर स्लिप क्लॉथ जो होता है वही रोल डाउन किया होता हुआ होता है जिसपे ये बुद्धिस्ट चैंटिंग चैंट्स लिखा हुआ चैंटिंग्स लिखी होती हैं या फिर उस पर कुछ भी डिपिक्शन की हुई होती हैं कुछ बुद्धिज्म की जो स्कल्पचर्स हैं या फिर जो फिगर्स है वो उस पर डिपिक्ट की हुई होती हैं वो यूजली यहाँ पे देखी जाती हैं और जब आप लद्दाख जाते हैं आउटसाइड मोनास्ट्रीज यू कैन सी दैट नंबर ऑफ थंका पेंटिंग्स आई हैव बीन अनफर्ड ओवर द व्हेन यू आर मूविंग ऑन द रोड सो दैट इट गिव्स द ग्लिम्स ऑफ एन एन एनवायरमेंट ऑफ बुद्धिज्म देयर इन द व्हेन यू एंटर इन द वैली ऑफ लद्दाख सो दैट इज द सिचुएशन देयर इन देम एंड आल्सो देयर आर द वॉल पेंटिंग्स म्यूरल्स दैट हैव बीन पेंटेड ओवर देयर बट आई माय सेल्फ वाज आल्सो अवेयर आई वाज आल्सो नोइंग दैट that thanka paintings are only the paintings which are uh, which are being painted over the cloth or uh, silk so that's it sir uh, hello i'm extremely sorry the storm hit really hard and so the electricity is gone here i'm sorry for the disturbance no no, no, no problem no problem it happens it happens sometimes Uh, hello uh, could could you please tell me where i should start from because i lost track uh, i think the so next should i start from like... here okay uh, should i start from this the the uh, thanka the origin uh, of the thankas yeah, please a uh, place click on the hide button there is a button hide uh, beside the stop seri you can click on that Okay thank you. Okay. Okay sir. Okay so the thankas that we see today um in the monasteries or in the museums which are displayed they do not date back to earlier than 11th to 12th century CE. Uh but then there are accounts there are uh, um you know textual sources which indicate that there was the concept or there was an idea which idea of painting on canvas even before 11th or 12th century ce so the first account that mentions about the painting is the fayans account that at tamralipta which is a major port town in uh, tomluk in west bengal he mentions that there was a flourishing uh, tradition of painting in in that in that town he does not mention anything whether it is on canvas or or anything else but he says that uh, the 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 um the tradition of painting did exist in tamralipta in 5th century arya manjushri mulakalpa which is a very important text uh, of the 8th century mentions about religious paintings on cloth now this strikes similarity with uh, the pottachitra tradition of bengal and orissa that we see even today where on canvas uh, religious themes are painted so this uh, finds similarity with thanka the pottachitra tradition and thankas they are similar in terms of their formal aspect in order to corroborate this uh, a song dynasty source um, a song dynasty source would be from th 10th century to 13th century uh, it mentions that in nalanda university there were priests who painted uh, images of buddhas bodhisattvas and other deities on cloth 
And in the 11th century uh, oral tradition, the tradition states that when Atisha Dipankar arrived in Tibet in 11th century, uh, precisely 1042 AD, he is said to have received gifts, many gifts, one among which was a woven thangka of 11-headed uh, Avalokiteshvara. So very many textual sources. Now this is attributed to you know the regular inflow and outflow of uh, students, of travelers, of monks uh, to the great universities of Nalanda, Vikram Shilau, Dantapuri, Soma, uh, Somapuri, or you know, etc. So this inflow and outflow of students, monks, and travelers uh, have rendered you know, disseminating these ideas, idea, not only the textual sources. Now, textual sources were translated to uh, Tibetan. They were taken from Nalanda and Vikram Shila and all other places uh, to their country. But there were also uh, but they also took important uh, you know, ideas about iconography, iconometry, and uh, and the related, and you know, the artistic traditions, basically. So there are textual sources from which the iconography and icon iconometry rules were uh, taken. And these are Arya Manjushri Mulakalpa, Kriya Samuchaya, Shadhanamala, and Nishpanna Yogabali in terms of iconography, and Chitra Lakshana by Nagnajit, Pratima Marna Lakshan by Atreya, Dashtala Nya Grota Pratima, Padi Mandala Buddha Pratima Lakshana, and Sambuddha Bhashita Pratima Lakshana Vivarana. So these were the texts, the treatises on iconography and iconometry, which were uh, which influenced the, the, the Tibetan paintings. Now let us have a look at the process that is involved in Thangka painting. And before I do so, I would like to mention that uh, Thangka, you know, studying Thangka is in-depth study of Thangka uh, has many components to it. One is the iconography, the symbols attached, the symbolism uh, that it, um, uh, you know, that we know from it, the iconometry and the processes, the iconology as well as the processes. So today I'm going to focus only on the processes uh, before the actual painting of um, uh, the, the before the actual painting, the process of painting starts. The Laripa has to meditate and attune himself to the same spiritual plane that he's about to create. Now, saying this, that he meditates upon what he's going to um, what he's going to um, you know create now before this like i mentioned the textual sources of iconography iconometry a laripa is required to know the entire doctrines the entire uh, you know doc the buddhist doctrines of mahayana vajrayana uh, he's uh, he's required to know the rules of the iconometry he's required to know uh, you know what he is going to draw when i say 11 headed avalokiteshvara or when somebody commissions a thangka what he is exactly going to draw the attendance um uh, the associated figures the posture the mudras or all, all of that and so with this vast scriptural knowledge that he acquires uh, you know, before he starts painting, he's required to meditate. Now, meditate because he has to pick and choose out of the vast knowledge that he has. He has to pick and choose that one deity or that one theme that he's to create and know exactly what to draw in that uh, empty canvas. So, uh, so all of this, um, uh, you know, all of this requires great amount of concentration. And so this is to channel his thoughts, channel, narrow down his thoughts, concentrate his thoughts uh, so that he can reproduce with finesse whatever he has been commissioned to do now apart from the apart from that the first step is to prepare the canvas um, which is tightly tied to the wooden frame so as in the picture we can see the canvas is tied to a bamboo stick and then further tied onto the wooden frame, which is known as stretchers. The surface of the canvas is then smoothened because this is because this is only um, 
uh, uh, cotton. No? So it, it can shrink as well. It can be crumbled. It can shrink. So it has to be stretched out very tightly. And so it has to be smoothened by a base material known as size. Now this size is made up of made uh, made by boiling the leather sorry boiling the skin of animals in tibet yak skin was used and in nepal water buffalo skin was used uh, so when this it, it produced a very um, you know a, a liquid a semi liquid of thick consistency and to the, to that chalk or lime or uh, kaolin clay was added and then it is known as gesso. The, the whole mixture is known as gesso. Now, this gesso was applied on the frontal as well as the reverse part of uh, the canvas in order to eliminate porosity uh, and also to kind of give it the required stiffness, you know, so that it can be rolled, it can be kept stiff, it can be rolled with ease and unrolled with ease. Now, the reason for eliminating porosity is simply that uh, when the colors are done, when the painting is done, it does not get blot on the other side. After that, geometric lines are drawn, horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines are drawn uh, with the help of graphite pencils. Earlier, charcoal was used instead of graphite pencil. And, uh, but today, because graphite is easily available, pencil, the normal pencils that we use is easily available. So uh, the, the, uh, geometric lines are drawn. The importance of this line is that the central figure, which is to be drawn, uh, it you know it determines the central position of the center figure, the main figure, and also that at, in the sides, no, there has to be um, enough space has to be kept for the brocade to be stitched later on. So uh, after the geometric lines are drawn, the sketching starts. The outlining or the sketching starts where the main theme or where the main figure is drawn uh, first, and then the topmost layer is drawn, the topmost uh, figure, and then it comes down gradually. After that, one by one, uh, the colors are filled. And uh, usually, this part is not done by the Laripa himself. He is helped by his um, students or apprent apprentices or assistants if he has. Now let us look at the colors. We were talking about the Shuntang Thangkas, the Chutsun Thangkas basically, which used organic dyes and the mineral pigments. And organic dyes, the organic dyes um, uh, were derived from vegetable or you know flower petals. So the black color is obtained from charcoal and the pink color from the flower petals. And as regards the mineral pigments, white color from lime, blue was extracted from ground lapis lazuli, azurite as or indigo, red color from cinnabar, vermilion or carmine, yellow color from sulfur or rielga, uh, which is arsenic disulfide, green from malachite or vitriol, and orange from minium. Now, uh, if we look at the, um, if we, if we, you know, by logic, if we look at the look, the mineral pigments are more in number and they are predominantly used. Organic colors are less used, mainly because, um, as we know, Tibet has a rich source of rich deposits of minerals and uh, other resources, whereas the vegetation happens to be very scanty. So that is one reason why uh, uh, minerals were prefer preferred to minerals were preferred as well as found um, compared to organic matter. Now these minerals are in the raw. The first picture shows the raw form of the minerals, and the second picture shows. Uh, after it is ground, after it is made into a powdered form. Now, the powdered form is mixed with the size that we talked about, the blue. The size that uh, it is mixed, the colors are mixed with size in stone bowls known as uh, tung, the name of the bowl. The vessel, vessel which is where, where the color is to be prepared is known as tung, and uh, it is mixed with wooden pestle known as tung sing. Sing basically means a rod or something that is round, like you know, rod or this pestle. After which the color is applied, and uh, the thangka looks like this. So this is after the painting is complete, but the entire process of creating a thangka is not complete. So um, 
Why? Because if uh, now it is advisable when the colors are being put, it is advisable to use uh, the colors. You know, like if blue color is used in several parts, you know, it is advisable to. Um, use all the places it is advisable to paint all the places where blue color is required first because then uh, it avoids the drying up of color and uh, once the color dries up if suppose the color dries up you know, uh, there is a you know there is a possibility of bringing back the consistency by pouring a little bit of size but too much of size also renders the thanka very glossy or some or you know it makes it very um, shiny in nature so which is not which is not desirable a perfect thanka is supposed to be matte in color but nowadays uh, there are traditional these traditional time consuming ways of preparing the color preparing um, you know the canvas or or you know other paraphernalias have given way to synthetic colors which are so easily available in the market it is convenient and as well as easily available in the market so once these colors are filled it is left to dry and uh, after the color is dried it is rubbed with a stone which is rubbed with smooth stone which is basically some uh, you know usually made of onyx or agate uh, the reason for this is it becomes resistant to cracking so once you uh, smoothen it once you rub this stone smooth stone on the thangkas, it makes it very supple and, and then, um, you know, gives it the required flexibility. Now, the most interesting part about it is when the, the painting is being done or when the figures are being painted, the eyes are not drawn. The reason why, reason is that a thangka has to be consecrated. It has, um, so the eyes are painted at last, you know, where? after the consecration ceremony the consecration ceremony is called rabne and when the eyes are painted there is a ritual for it which is called shinje in uh, sanskrit i think it's called chakshudan where you have you infuse life into the painting you know where you draw the painting or you infuse life the prana pratishta after the prana pratishta is done so uh, the consecration is done by writing uh, the mantra om ahum swaha at the back uh, this consecration is why you know the reason this consecration is so important is uh, that the thanka it does not only represent the artistic tradition it also represents the spiritual tradition you know people meditate upon it so it is as close to the divine it is as close to the thought of god and uh, so without conse consecrating it the entire spiritual value attached to it becomes null and void and that is one reason why um, after a thangka is made the most important part is to consecrate or you know infuse life into it so uh, after this the thangka is taken off the stretcher it is mounted off the stretcher and then beautiful brocades are uh, um, you know put onto it so it is surrounded by brocades this brocade is known as uh, known by the name gasser and the main painting is enclosed by two bands here we have the two bands uh, red in color they, this can also be yellow it is either red or yellow in color and these bands are known as ajama at the bottom of the um, at the bottom of this entire thangka there are two rods if you can see there is a rod which is a, a you know a roll roll sort of thing a wooden or a metallic roll it is called tansin and it helps uh, the thangka in rolling or un unrolling or rolling of the thangka and also just next to the painting there is a very thin um, thin border let's say the red and the um, the red and the yellow border this is this signifies the door of the thangka. So thangka, if it is thought to be divine, if it is thought to be a paradise or you know something divine, then this is the door to the thangka, and the entire brocade is symbolizes the edifice or the 
the place where the God lives, the divine lives. Now, considering that Thanka is such a precious and a sacred object for, uh, the pra for practicing Buddhists, it is hung in the monasteries or uh, kept with all sanctity attached to it in the prayer altars of our houses. Now, this makes the Thanka susceptible to damage uh, by dust, by smoke from butter lamps or incense sticks. And so in order to avoid that, there is a veil which is provided. Uh, the red and the yellow on top of the Thanka, which you can see, is the veil. So when, uh, so when the Thanka is not used, you know, during rituals or um, oh, when it is just kept like that, a, a veil is the veil, a veil is provided which uh, uh, kind of keeps it from you know getting damaged from dust or smoke etc this uh, veil is called a shell kip now in the year this is a, the picture of a complete thanka so one once this is done it is it can be taken to home or it can be donated to monasteries as monasteries and monks are the most uh, are the ardent commissioners of uh, you know thanka paintings so in the year 2017, I had an opportunity to meet a Thanka painter, Alaripa, and his name was um, Mr. Dawagen Bhutia. He lives in Darjeeling and he very kindly and very generously allowed me to peek into his world of Thanka painting. So uh, during, you know, during my field work, you know, when I would stay with him for hours and hours, he would tell me small little anecdotes about him or even his father was a Laripa. So he comes from a family of Laripas. So he would tell me that uh, there are so many things, so many, especially tools, utensils, or, you know, so many uh, paraphernalia that has changed from his father's time to his times. So he would often tell me that, um, you know, his father used charcoal to draw um, the outlines which he has now substituted it with graphite pencils because it's more easily available and also charcoal uh, tends to soil the hand so that in turn tends to sometimes soil the canvas apart from that if a mistake was made uh, his father was, would use vulture's feather as um, you know a rubber as an eraser to erase what what the mistaken part was now this was very interesting to me and another interesting thing was the two kinds of paint brushes that he mentioned. One was the thick kind, which would do uh, flat painting. And the other one was the thin kind, which would do line drawings, basically. So the, th the thin uh, paint brushes were made from cat's fur. And the thick paint brushes were made from the fur of goat's kid. Not the goat, but the goat's kid. And um, these paint brushes, is are set to uh, these were tied onto a wooden uh, wooden bamboo uh, sorry a wood or bamboo and the, with the help of wire and he, and he said that these would withstand damage and um, uh, much uh, damage and um, uh, you know weathering much more i mean it would go on for a very long time so the, he did not did not have to change the paint brushes again and again they would they could use it for years and years on end So uh, as we move along, uh, you know, we notice that the liturgical value, this the ritual value or the spiritual value of a thangka may not have changed. Even today, uh, it is making a painting, making a thangka painting or commissioning a thangka painting uh, earns, is believed to earn a lot of merit. But you know, the way it is made, the way uh, you tend, the way tools have changed, it uh, depends upon how much is available around the convenience of of you know having it you know the convenience of getting those material so making a thangka is a very laborious task it is not an easy easy task so it is um, said that an apprentice or a student wanting to learn a thangka is required to stay with his master for at least 11 years in order to master all the technical aspects 
as well as in order to master all the scriptural knowledge that he has to acquire before even venturing into the main painting part he has to master all the um, uh, the scriptural knowledge the doctrinal tenets you know of uh, buddhism of vajrayana buddhism so um so it is a task which requires a lot of patience dedication practice perfection and detailed knowledge of these scriptures of the texts so what can be said about athanka is that it is a beautiful symphony or you know a beautiful blend of artistic spiritual and liturgical practices uh, so which is also one of the reasons why alaripa is treated with utmost respect because he becomes the medium which uh, through which the intangible something which is only a thought something which is only a concept and uh, turns it into tangible you know or manifests it into something we can physically see uh thank you so much so i'll uh, so these are some of the paintings this was the painting which was done by his father so this is his recent one of the 21 taras this is paldan lamo uh, also known as uh, shri devi this is chongkapa the um, founder of uh, gelugpa order of buddhism vajrayana buddhism this is tara again and this is a sakya hierarch thank you thank you so much upasana it was a very beautiful lecture now i call upon Mr. thank you so much Now I call upon Mr. Abdul Adil Pare to present the word of thanks. A very good evening to all the distinguished scholars and uh, our respected audience, and happy Buddha Purnima. Uh, I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the word of thanks on behalf of Heritage Society Kashmir Circle. on this great and memorable virasat talk titled of canvas and colors a case study of thanka paintings in darjeeling uh first of all foremost i thank and express my heartfelt gratitude to our special guest and distinguished speaker miss upasna chetri ma'am who enlightened us all by her impressive talk over thanka paintings i owe special gratitude to our dynamic leader and chairman of the webinar and director general heritage society dr anant ashutosh tiwari sir for his incredible love and passion to disseminate the various facets of our cultural of our cultural heritage through various platforms and engaging the youth in this process i also would like to acknowledge our gratitude to mr azad hind gulshan nanda sir who is director buddhist heritage research institute heritage society for organizing today's event and his welcome address i must mention uh, my deep sense and a sense of appreciation to dhamma ratna ji uh, who is research assistant heritage society nalanda chapter for soul refreshing buddhist chanting i express my sincere thanks to all declare uh who was program convener uh, who is program convener and heritage of heritage society maharashtra circle and for moderating this event i take this opportunity to extend our most sincere thanks to our audience on various social media platforms of the heritage society for their keen attention to make the event a success thanks one and all thank you so much thank you Thank you, Abdullah. Thank you, thank you.